the structure for we have a commitment to do X or Y. I mean, I, I get all that, but as I read the policy, and I, I see five to six percent minimum, I asked her, I said, you know, uh, what are some other cities and towns look like in terms of that stabilization fund? And again, I just want to <coughs> mention that there has been a continued commitment to try to be yes, up in the stabilization. Correct. But when I look at cities and sometimes we're compared to like Newton, for example, I know their budget, they're a little bit more, a little bit more I think budget. The AAA rating. 8.7%. Brockton over 11%, same budget number. Lynn 8.2%. So where I understand we're trying to continue to push ourselves and get better, I also would be interested in, 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 in defining a goal, like a stretch goal, like 10% of uh, overall budget. So if you did some rough math, right, 300, 10% of that's $30 million. And I've also mentioned that to Mr. Powers when I was on the phone with them and some of the rating analysts and what they told me is exactly what you said. There's a baseline where they'll look at your financial policy and your management policy and let you stabilization, for example. Anything above 6%, that's actually going to improve your management component of the credit rating. The 5 to 6 is a base. They want us that to the first level. They openly encourage me in every call to absolutely I should be shooting for 20. They said four to eight is adequate, eight to 15 is strong. And I quote, those are the words that they use. So I think personally, and I'm again, I like to state my goals in black and white so I know where I'm heading. I don't think having a stated goal of you know, 10% over time is unrealistic to you. No, we could adjust that higher once we, we have a certain level that we can maintain. We did hit it last year, June 30th, the year end. And we had to expend 3.7 million on the uh, deficit in the snow and ice. You so, hit what? I'm sorry. Pardon me. You hit 10 percent of what? No, we we were at the 5.6 percent level in, in, in June 30th, uh, um, 2016. That's uh, the financial statements that the rating agency used to give us the double A plus stable rating. So they were happy to see that. Uh, we, we have to work back up to that level to maintain the rating and keep going. So would it be out of the realm of possibility if we put an amendment to the language to say a minimum level of 5 to 6% reserves of audited general fund revenue of the previous fiscal year with a stated long-term goal of 10%? Absolutely, that would be, I'd welcome that. But I'd put that in the motion, and this is on page one of the uh, proposed financial Part of my reason for striking that is that, uh, again, it strikes me as in a budget process, kind of suggesting a certain level of almost a carte blanche, whoever the mayor is at any given, given point. And we've already, I think it's very acceptable that they talk about, uh, again, maintaining a certain level of depth in relation to the budget without necessarily, that that, that, that alone should be shaped in what uh, I think is in our uh, 
in our, in our annual budget. So I would make a motion to strike that um, the fourth paragraph. Thank you, Mr. Where did this stunt come from? Where did this stunt come from? Uh, the, on the ceiling? So the uh, one that he's trying to start here. From, uh, um, I had a recommendation of between, I want to say, nine to 12 different communities from Cindy McNerney, from um, uh, First Southwest, our banker. Uh, I guess the Tilton Securities now. And, and from all the clients she works with, she cherry <coughs> um, the best uh, policies and procedures that she could find, that she had worked with cities and towns on to establish. Because the rating agency is not just telling us to do this, they're telling other the cities and towns to do this is the way to go. So as they get adopted, uh, she's been uh, creating a file for me, as well as Eric in the finance office doing digging on his own. And we know who the triple A rated cities are. They're the one not the bubbles. So Eric was uh, uh, feverishly researching all the triple A communities, Brookline, Newton, um, the several communities that do a great job. We're in a better financial position than some of them, but they were a little bit ahead of us as far as these written policies. So we lifted them actually. We copied their policy. That was one of the ones that, that uh, we took as, as, a, as a floor. Okay. But, um, from the last, I mean, there's a capital improvement that was presented to us last year. What was the percentage there represented? Uh, on, the, on the debt finance? Yeah. It was right around 5.4%. We're at 5.6 now. So I think I'm just trying to understand uh, why Council Fed believes that this is sort of like a carte blanche because they see the need to have something in the financial policies that illustrates the need to replace assets over time. Uh, but I've yet to see, um, in my short tenure on this council, a listing of assets in their, their lives as they, through each department, uh, in terms of priority, and who maintains that, do you? Uh, we have a list of, of, of the assets, <coughs> and we age them, and have to be pretty active in communicating, we usually do it in the audit time, we do it before budget time, the department has Naturally, the largest department head will, will have the most interaction as far as what we do, people that run out of service or snow fighting equipment or the street sweepers, whatever it might be. The bigger they are, the more pieces of equipment they have to manage. So we have to update that um, each year. So then what's the alternative then? Is the alternative that we, we continue to go about our willy-nilly spending and we don't have an adopted policy then that says we'll spend 5% a year? So you'll just come to us ad hoc. Uh, I think it's I think it's a balance. I think I think we interview the department heads. I think we listen to their needs. I think when you have to uh, uh, deal with public safety officers who say they have fire engines that aren't going to last that long, we probably put those sort of life and death thing, life and death things ahead of snow equipment. Well, you you highlight a very important point because I, I mean I don't think this is a listening exercise. This is asset assets and they have lives and you know how long they're going to live. So it's not just someone saying, I need this, get this, this is you know, right. a kid in a toy store. Um, <clears throat> I, I went, did some homework, I went and took a look at, at Newton, for example. Uh, and this is a 200 page capital improvement uh, plan that they put together with details that highlight everything that you could ever want from each department, but at least it's listed in terms of priority, in terms of department, in terms of asset, um, and it shows over time how those assets will uh, will die and we need to replace them. Um, so, you know, I understand the need for spending, uh, you know, every year to have this five year rolling capital improvement plan. Um, but I'm just trying to understand what would be the commitment to providing the factual details for the replacement of certain assets as we go along with the renewal of this yearly rolling improvement and committing to 5% per year. I don't, uh, I don't know how much manpower uh, went behind that. Looked at something similar. Is that Newton? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there were outside you know, vendors utilized, and, and the uh, contract price I understand was in six figures to help them compile a lot of that information. We're doing it on our own right now with some guys by, by our auditors only and how we set things up and the procedures and questions we should ask. So if we were to put a lot more resources in, 
probably produce a similar document. <coughs> if you were that far away from the crucial information that's in that document, yeah. being able to present it to you, talking about the serial numbers and asset names and life and cost of equipment. Uh, well, I can understand sort of, I mean, I, I have a hard time understanding that department heads wouldn't manage the most, you know, a costly assets per department. Is that what you're saying? So that there's no. No, I'm not, I'm not criticizing the department head. They're, they're working with what they're working with. Right. right. We went through a recession not too long ago and lost a lot of people. We're kind of building up back to those levels that we were in 2008, 2009. Uh, we're also replacing assets as we go along the way. Uh, I think we could do a better job on, on the record keeping aspect of it. I don't know if we get to the level of that two or three, two inch document. On, on the, the assets themselves and the pictures and so forth. But uh, we can do a better job than we have as far as giving you a detailed inventory. Okay. okay. I don't think that helps me make a decision, but. Um, well, as we go forward, we're getting better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Thin, but just for the record, the uh, regularly scheduled ordinance committee meeting at the indulgence of uh, Madam Chair Warren allowed us to continue this conversation, but it is quarter of seven. Um, so just want everyone to sort of be mindful. We'll take as much time as we need on this. We're just trying to do the time to our council in any place. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Councilor. And again, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> again, I'm not proposing against planning or capital plan um, at all. Um, what I am reacting to is something I think it's been a trend over the time that I've been here, which continues to somewhat limit the discretion of the council as it relates to the budget, per se. And uh, again, I th as, I, as noted, I think it's responsible on the part of all of us to keep our bonding to a certain specific limit. Um, but this idea of proposing, you know, minimum growth, so to speak, of, of 5%, that's dedicated to our debt service. Our debt service should be based on the reality of what we're financing and funding. That's a very simple point, all I'm trying to make. Um, again, it's there, it's important for the administration in the budget process to make their case. Um, if, you, if, you, if you start with the 5%, um, that somewhat limits our capacity in, in regards and limits our discretion this body, and again, at the end of the day, the taxpayers are expecting us to keep some eye uh, on these matters. So I, I, again, this is not a statement against having a capital plan. It's not about the value of, of having a healthy debt service from how we work it. It's just that I, I'm reacting to having a minimum or stating minimum as a policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And there is a, uh, there is a Council Finn to strike that section of the proposed financial policy. I don't know if anyone else has any further discussion on that motion. Uh, Council Commonwealthy. So I just want to clarify what the motion. I have some questions afterwards, but to clarify the motion, you want to just strip away that language. Just want to strike the fourth paragraph of the debt service policy and have what the minimum on the last page. Right. The last policy. Okay. So you're taking out the whole the whole notion. Just striking that specific. I mean, to me, the first paragraph covers um, the issue that they want to maintain a total outstanding debt service uh, payments in relation to 67.5 percent. To me, that should be the policy. Uh, I do not think it's wise for this body to limit any of its discretion, as limited as it already is, around specifically the budget. I mean, to me proposing a minimum as a policy and us approving or voting that for all intents and purposes in my mind for limiting our own discretion. Well, I, uh, thank you for clarifying that. I support the, the motion. I'll vote in favor of it. Uh, you know, we vote for policies up here all the time, whether or not they follow or not is a whole other question. <laughs> we also have a policy in the URDP that we're going to push for affordable housing in the downtown. There's a policy with no teeth. So I have no problem taking Taking this out, and I, and I share the concerns that Councillor Finn raised, is that we're tying the hands essentially of uh, future councillors who may sit in this in this chamber. You know, 
for, a, for an administration, not this one, but perhaps another one gets up there and says, well, this is the policy, so, you know, this is, what, this is what's always been discussed. This is the way we've done it, the way we talked about doing it, so this is why we're doing it. So, um, I'll support that, that motion. Any further discussion, again, the uh, motion on the floor is to strike that last paragraph on the final page about, that talks about the 5% minimum. Any further discussion on that before we go to roll? Council DeBono? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so 5% minimum, is there any cap on the spending per year on a percentage point, or is there any cap on the top end of this where it could be at? Uh, the, the, we, it was recommended to us that we not exceed 7.5% as a ratio, as a percentage of our budget. Okay, I, just to clarify that, okay. Um, so five to seven, seven point five percent of the top. Six to seven point five percent would be the acceptable range for a community our size. Our Is that what's happening at the double A, triple A plus rating? That would be double A plus and and five. So just to get back a little bit on one question, I was clarifying as well. In, in terms of what Council Finn was kind of talking about, there, you kind of have to spend. They're, they're kind of pushing us to spend. Um, and you're talking about adopting these principles and ideologies on how to spend. Um, of these communities and municipalities, do they still work out to be something near Quincy, Massachusetts, 94,000 people? Um, how, do, how, do they, how do they measure that based on communities and populations? The recommendation is by the investment banker. In some cases, I don't think there was an exact tie to so, you know, an industrialized city with 94,000 people and, and a certain percentage of immigrants. Sometimes it just made sense as a policy that the bankers thought would be adaptable to Quincy. Uh, there were other cities that, uh, with, with the uh, reserve levels being close to 10 percent, in some cases in excess of 10 percent, that were right in our range, which they were encouraging us to get up there with them. Uh, to be more like Brookline, to be more like Newton, uh, to put more in stabilization for a rainy day, uh, put more money aside uh, to, to reach their level. So, kind of a mix. Is there a combination of any type of, um, um, I guess I could say, the combination of having this, like, it's hard to explain here, give you the notion, but. Based on what we're doing in the city right here today in Queens, Massachusetts, is all this economic growth. They, they factor that in as a factor. Absolutely. They're looking, they're looking at uh, Quincy as a part of the greater Boston region. They see that the growth that we're experiencing, in particular residential values, and some strong development that, that's coming more our way, uh, they consider it as a region. They, they know specifically what the uh, neighboring cities are. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Cavanaugh. All set, Council? Yeah. Councilor Hughes on the... This one? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, no, I, I just wanted to uh, make a point uh, regarding uh, Councilor Finn's uh, <coughs> amendment and, and striking that paragraph because I, I would be inclined to think that we will always carry 5%, a minimum of 5% uh, debt service on, the, our, on our operating budget. But I'm swayed by um, Councilor Pamuchi as well as Councilor Finn's argument that it's not this particular administration, but future administrations and or councils that we should be stewarding things for now. So, um, so, so I am swayed um, by that argument, even though I don't believe this to be necessarily, um, you know, detrimental or dangerous on on its face, but. Um, but thinking of it in those terms for a longer term and for future, uh, you know, folks yet to come that we don't know. And again, not to um, obviously n nothing reflecting on this particular administration, um, but for things we don't know coming down the road. So I'll, I'm uh, inclined and will be supporting Councilor Ken's um, motion to strike. So thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Any further discussion on the motion, folks? Okay. Please. Council King? Yes. Council Bowman? Yes. Council Harris? Yes. Council Harris? Yes. Council Harris? Yes. Council Hughes? Yes. Council Hughes? Yes. Council Hughes? Yes. Council Hughes? Yes. Council Hughes?
Any, uh, any further discussion on the financial policies at large? Council Palmucci. Thank you, Chairman Kroll. I was digging through my desk here because I could have sworn I remembered 5% being the, the number that we were given, uh, not 6 to 7.5%. Um, the last time Cinder talked to us, or one of the times that Cinder talked to us, and I found the piece of paper, and it's not entirely, it's mostly my notes, but um, I don't even know what it's from. The date on the paper that I referenced is May 1st, 2014, and it was a discussion about long-term bond debt service, uh, and it was a schedule at that point prepared by First Southwest. And uh, it just has some comment. One of, one of the things that I noted in that discussion was that the minimum recommended was 5%. So, but now we're saying the minimum um, that we'd like to see in a policy is, well, we're saying we don't, but right. what's presented to us was six to seven and a half percent. Right. right. I feel as though it's kind of creeping up on us. Like it's, that number just keeps, keeps that creeping number, up. That number was specifically increased by the investment bankers to reflect higher costs in, in uh, construction equipment, uh, things we're bonding for. Schools. Uh, but so I just I just want to fundamentally understand this. I'm not a numbers guy um, uh, as much as some of the other folks up here are. So maybe take it a little bit slow with me. But so what we're saying here is that six to seven and a half percent is our debt service is the percentage of our overall budget that we should be spending on debt service. Correct. Those are, are benchmark figures that if we're in that range, we're helping. Okay. So our debt service is what we pay for essentially loans to the city, bonds to the Everything. city. Everything. Right. So, bear with me here. So the people who are telling us we should increase the amount of money we're spending on our borrowing costs are the same investment bankers who would then be profiting from the increased borrowing? Correct, but experts in their field. Right, experts in the field, yeah. Yeah, Wall Street, They're known to leave um, it So, that uh, was uh, 2014 that we were talking about 5%. Yes. I believe we were talking about 5% last year. I think 5 to 6%. So it's, and now it's 6 to 7.5%. Correct. Okay. I mean, I have the same problem with that. Express. And we're at 5.6%, which represents a far more measured approach to increasing our borrowing costs. I think, I was looking at this in 2014, yeah, 2014. Um, this was including the track at that point and all the capital projects then. We were at 5.5%. So we've relatively maintained an even keel. I mean, we're up by one tenth of a percent, which could be you know, a result of some refinancing and, and, and whatnot. But, that's a level that I'm pretty comfortable with. Um, the, other, the other issue that when you were talking kind of struck me as not making sense um, is that in order to get a higher rating for the city, bond rating for the city, we would need to borrow more. Is that essentially what you were saying when you're comparing us to like Newton and some other municipalities? The conversation uh, that was had with Cindy McNerney uh, regarding the increase in the percentage, and, and it was her specific recommendation to increase it was in light of uh, all of the development that the city is uh, expected to uh, participate in, I guess is the right word, as part of the DIF district. And in light of us uh, encouraging and working along with uh, developers growing this dip district and we not tie our hands with a lower rating of 5 to 6 percent um, that, that a more rural area or an area that's not going to have a dip district with hopefully a lot going on in it. Uh, that's betting be on that the future. Kind of I mean, that's betting on the future. That's saying we're going to set up a policy where we borrow more money. We're going to borrow more money, take on more debt because we want to please the investment bankers. We're going to give us a better credit rating and we're betting on the future of the downtown, essentially, right? I mean, it's a... Essentially, they're saying don't handcuff yourself with a lower number or what you think, see as an acceptable ratio. Give yourself some room. Uh, you're, you're participating in a DIF district. A lot of development could require more investment by the city. 
don't cut yourself off, give yourself the room, and she recommended the six to seven and a half percent. To go into the policy. So when you're saying give yourself, don't handcuff yourself to a lower amount, it's give yourself in the policy additional room, right? Correct. So if we don't have a policy where the only limit to the debt, which I'm certainly not advocating to go up to, is statutorily set. That's correct. But the, the whole one of the points of establishing the policy and have, having it publicly voted on and endorsed by the council is that you're setting it up for the city. So with changes in administration, you're looking to a policy that's been carried on by, by the city council, voted hopefully 2017. So in 2022, you're dealing with something that was set up five years ago. It's not subject to one finance director's thoughts on a map. Which, which is interesting to me because you're saying that's the benefit and that's the exact reason why I voted against having that in the policy because a much younger, better looking city councilor <laughs> 10 years from now might not want to be handcuffed to that, to that number. They might, want to, they might want to go the other way. They might want to say, listen, we want to be um, you know, less, uh, less, less debt laden than we are today. Hypothetically, I agree with you, and they have to vote on that right. by votes. Right. And they can always change the policy or just ignore the policy like we do in some other instances, like the board laws in the downtown. Democracy. Right. Democracy. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate the presentation. Appreciate the information. Sure. Any uh, <coughs> further questions for Mr. Chaffin? No. Just kind of wondering uh, something. I had wrote it down and I think you covered it. So this six to seven and a half percent areas, if you will, is or encompasses the dip district as well. As, as the total amount of debt, yes, they, they would look at everything. And in light of the development that's going on, maybe not just in the dip, but what happened peripherally, uh, uh, Senator McNerney said you should not. Limit yourself to the five to six, you should increase that to seven and a half. So, so we did it on your consideration, obviously, the new Sterling is on for the, the anticipated parking garage that will pay for any other underground uh, <coughs> infrastructure that will be responsible for in the downtown. The uh, street light proposal potentially, I mean, they're looking at everything comes up under one umbrella, and that is your rate. Correct. And we'll always be answerable to that and provide you with the detailed information to what the percentage comes out with any reading. And the analysts, third party professionals, they came up with that target range six to seven and a half percent. Uh, yes, but based on other cities' action <coughs> policies that they provided. It wasn't just an abstract conversation, that they actually set a policy. I almost wonder like when you authorize a $10 million bond, like how much incrementally does that increase your percentage? We can tell you that. that would be whenever, whenever, whenever you're going to vote on an authorization, we can tell you exactly to the to a decimal point what it what will do to our ratio. Six, seven and a half percent. It's like a 20% sliding scale, right? Between mm -hmm. those two numbers? Roughly. Yeah. It seems. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one final note. We might address some of the concerns Council of Health has, but particularly now, as you're talking about having set benchmarks for these various funds, we're clearly at some point with free cash to come back to the appropriation to, to those funds that we take, correct, Mr. Kavanaugh? Correct. So I think, given the fact that we've set benchmarks, um, through uh, Mr. Chairman to the auditor, but also through your role as finance chair, if we can set up a way to ascertain if we're meeting those percentages as appropriations come in, that they in fact are actually consistent with the policies that they have in place um, that could be reported to us. Um, You're saying a free cash time will be on the 20 Correct, so that, so that the auditor can verify for us that those are meeting the benchmarks. Is necessary at the end of this point to make certain that this is 
this is occurring at the time once free cash is established, correct? This isn't after you. you're going to take a percentage of the remainder, so to speak, after you've made discretionary no, I, appropriations I, that are coming in. I think that uh, just having a simple phrase uh, at the time of certification of free cash right. and following policy for a Thank you. I would, uh, I would motion that we add that language. Uh, Mr. Kavanaugh, <laughs> doing this off the top of my head, might not take that. At the time of certification of free cash, the following policies will apply. You do that right in the intro um, component. Let's put that in the form of motion. Yes. <laughs> add that under policy purpose and rules. Any, uh, any discussion on cost of the motion? Which is to essentially uh, put up a framework that, that uh, distributes the free cash into the set accounts once once the certification takes place. Did I cover that correctly, Councilor? Yes, thank you. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Council Kane? Yes. Council Bowens? Yes. Council Penn? Yes. Council Harris? Yes. Council Hughes? Yes. Council LaFar? Yes. Council Leon? Yes. Council Pomichi? No. Chairman Cole? Yes. Councilor, do you know I am, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Okay. Any further discussion on the policies before us? Does anybody have any sort of takeaways for the market? This team, you know, pretty comfortable and confident with what's before us. Uh, obviously, with the amendments added on to it. That's a question. Anybody want to? To approve the financial policies as they stand before us with the noted amendments. Any discussion on the, uh, on the motion?
Um, <coughs> all fees for the commissioning agent uh, covered by MSBA. Um, moving forward, I'd like to give you a brief history and summary of the project before Jonathan uh, makes his presentation. Um, last February, the City Council Board authorized the Superintendent of Schools to submit to the MSBA a statement of interest to perform a feasibility study to replace boilers that are desperately in need of replacement at after and how Mary Mountain Walls. In May, the MSBA visited the four schools, meaning that they were all candidates for boiler replacements and boiler room upgrades. In August, the MSBA assigned the city and OPM an engineer to conduct a feasibility study for the boiler project at the four schools. In November, the MSBA officially accepted the project into the feasibility study. And on February 2017, <coughs> The MSBA Board of Directors voted to approve the project budget funding agreement. We are in hopes of getting a jump start on this project during the April vacation, the official start of the project, the end of June, and school recesses for the summer vacation. Our plan is to be substantially completed with the project by the end of September. And work in September that punch list guidance, etc., would not interfere with in classroom and school activity. It's a wonderful project for the city because it not only replaces boilers, but completely upgrades the entire boiler room and all related equipment within the space. The city, city will receive 66.12% reimbursement of eligible project costs from the MSBA. Thanks to the efforts of Mayor Cope, Quincy City Council, and Dr. D. Chris Faro, the city has been able to participate in the MSBA Accelerated Museum Program over the past few years. Um, it, being part of that program, we have new windows and doors at Marymount, Wollaston, Parker, and, and Lincoln Hancock Elementary Schools, as well as North Quincy High School. Last summer, we installed a new roof at Marymount Elementary School. In this summer, we will be installing new windows, doors, and roof at Beachwood Knoll Elementary School. It has been a great opportunity for the public buildings department to participate in these projects and see the dramatic changes they have made to our school buildings in the community. Um, Jonathan Breton will uh, give a PowerPoint presentation of the project. So, Thank you. Uh, so my intent is just to give a brief overview of the scope for the proposed project. Uh, and then Paul Callis with Hill at OPM is going to give a brief overview of the budget and the schedule of the project. Uh, so you're looking at a map here that shows Atherton, Beachwood, and Mary Mount Wollaston, the four elementary schools part of the project. to replace the boilers at each of the four elementary schools. Uh, as Walter said, there's additional work that is included with that. So at the end of the day, we're going to have a fully renovated mechanical room at each project. Um, MSBA is planning to fund 66.12% of the eligible budget costs. Um, the project is currently being bid right now. It's open for bid to contractors. Uh, with the intention being to complete construction in October this year. Um, and like I said, we're going to go through the scope, the budget, and the schedule. Uh, so the first school is Atherton Howe. Um, so we're just going to quickly talk about what we're doing uh, in the oil room. Um, so what we're looking at here is uh, two boilers. Um, the one on the left was installed in 2007. Mm -hmm. The one on the right is the one that we're going to replace. Uh, this is installed in 1949, and it is more or less on its last legs. Um, so the unit on the left is going to remain. The unit on the right is going to get replaced. Uh, we are also replacing an emergency generator in this room and completing additional emergency electrical system upgrades. Um, 
we're going to be abating hazardous materials, uh, providing a new combustion air system, and also subsequent to the boiler work, replacing the lighting, the water heater, and additional piping. Uh, this school is a little bit different than the other schools in the way that we were doing it, and I think it was an ad alternate. Uh, the reason being that we need to stay below a $500,000 threshold at this school so as not to trigger additional ADA requirements. So we've prepared several ad alternates um, in order to obtain pricing on this scope without uh, being required to include it in the project. So that ad alternate scope includes um, removal of lead paint, replacement of a sump pump in a new pipe trench, uh, replacement of an air compressor, um, new condensate pump for the steam system, and also a removal of a several thousand gallon abandoned oil tank in the room adjacent to the boiler room. Uh, so moving on to Beach Renewal, uh, we're looking at a photo of the existing boilers. Um, these ones are a bit newer, they were installed in 1994. Uh, but with this system being a hot water system instead of a steam, steam system, uh, there's a large opportunity for energy savings. So our intent is to install high efficiency gas fire equipment. Um, we also plan to replace the pumps with variable volume pumps, which will see additional energy savings over the existing setup. Um, we're going to be installing uh, new controls for the new equipment, LED lighting, uh, a new water heater that's going to use less energy than the existing. Um, we're going to be replacing mechanical piping uh, and doing some additional upgrades to improve functionality in the system. Uh, moving on to Marina. The school is a little bit more similar to Atherton. Uh, there was also a newer boiler installed in 2007. That's the one on the left here. Uh, the one on the right was installed in approximately 1950. Like Atherton, it is not in good shape, so this is the one that we're going to re uh, replace. Again, the one on the left will remain. Um, there are also found to be hazardous materials at this school that will be abated as part of this project in the mechanical room. Um, new combustion air, new heat exchanger for the hot water heating system, the um, oil tank that has been abandoned will also be removed as part of this project. Uh, new high efficiency lighting, a new water heater, uh, piping will also be replaced. Uh, there's an air compressor for controls that has been replaced as part of this project. Uh, and similar to the other schools, there's some additional mechanical equipment and painting that's planned. <coughs> So Marigo is one of the two <coughs> schools out of the four where we're required to do some ADA upgrades. Uh, I mentioned it briefly before at Atherton, but there's a dollar threshold where if you spend over that amount, you're required to upgrade the accessibility of the building for 521 CMR. Uh, so at this school, in general, it was compliant, but there were some minor items that needed to be brought into compliance. So the picture that you're looking at on the left um, with some minor modifications to the entrance. Uh, the parking lot is going to be having some small area regraded um, and then some modifications made for a handicap parking spot. Uh, the plan that you're looking at on the right is of the bathrooms near the gymnasium. So, new partitions, some modifications to the plumbing fixtures, and a new drinking fountain will be installed to apply of accessibility upgrade requirements. Uh, so this is the last boiler room in Wallaston. Uh, again, this one is similar to Atherton and Meridian. Uh, the boiler on the left was installed in 2007 and will remain. The boiler on the right was installed in 1949. It's in poor condition. It will be replaced as part of this project. Um, this school contain hazardous materials as well, which will be abated as part of this work. Um, the combustion air system will be replaced. New high efficiency LED lighting will be installed in the mechanical room. Uh, and similar to the other schools, we're also going to be replacing the water heater, piping, air compressor, 
and onions in it. Uh, there's an additional scope to do a little bit of painting in this room. Uh, so like Mary Mount, Walston, uh, because of the dollar value being spent from the mechanical room, uh, we're required to do some ADA upgrades. Uh, Walston needed a significantly more robust upgrade than Mary Mount. Um, so the bathrooms on the first floor of the gymnasium are being completely renovated. Uh, so the plan on the left is the existing floor plan. The plan on the right is the proposed floor plan. Um, and so all of the fixtures, partitions, ceilings, floors, and most of the walls are being removed. Um, so we're going to be completely installing new flooring, new ceilings, new partitions, new plumbing fixtures, new drinking fountain, uh, and essentially rebuilding these two restrooms to comply with the required ADA upgrades that we need to do for this project. I'm going to pass it over to Paul Callis for the Taylor National to get through the project budget. Thank you very much. Um, just briefly, the uh, total project budget, uh, which has been accepted and voted by the MSBA at uh, the Board of Directors meeting for the entire project, all four schools. $3,542,015. The MSBA will reimburse pay up to $2,245,090. So uh, it's roughly two thirds uh, of the project. Uh, and there are certain items that uh, are not eligible for reimbursement, including the pavement that takes place in the building, uh, replacement of the removal of the oil tank. Uh, and other line items such as the uh, uh, legal fees, but your time large, most of the cost of these for this project is going to be reimbursable by the MSBA. Uh, and briefly, the schedule, uh, as uh, Walter had indicated, uh, the substantial completion to have the, uh, the oil rooms up and running and operational before the heating season starts up again. Uh, that date September 29th for the substantial completion. Even the season begins October 15th. And uh, work that takes place outside of the environment of the uh, oil room, such as the ADA improvements, uh, need to be completed before school starts and substantial completion date for that is August 25th. And if you have any other questions, we'll be glad to answer them. This is actually a pretty good presentation. Okay. So what we're going to do now, we're right at about 7 or 30. We're going to recess the finance committee meeting. Madam President is going to open up the regular city council meeting, and then we will come back to the finance committee where council will ask questions should they have. So at this point, 